Hello everyone, Russ of Aquarimax here. Uh, getting started a little bit late, sorry about that. But today we're going to talk a little bit about shrimp. So um, I'm going to help my daughter, she wants to join in the live stream, and I'm going to help her get in. Oh look, like somebody's already liked it, which is great. Um, let's see if we can get this uh, working for you. Um, maybe you should do it on the uh, computer there, I don't know. Oh, Hold on everybody, sorry about this. Just uh, for some reason, I can't get it to work on this other computer. But um, mess around with that a little bit. A notification should show up in a second that it's live. But thank you for joining us. Today we're going to talk about shrimp. As I mentioned, we're also going to do generalized Q&A. Let me make sure the chat is going. If everyone can que uh, just give me a quick shout out to let me know you're here, that'd be great. Uh, Famous Jones, hello, welcome. Johnny Huerta, hello from Utah. Oh, greetings. And... Michael Salazar. Hey, you're in. Nice. Well, thanks for joining in. And we will, like I said, we'll open it to um, the chat really soon. I just wanted to get started by talking about shrimp. I am really excited to get some uh, blue velvet shrimp. I'm looking forward to that. And so I thought I'd talk a little bit about that. I've been keeping shrimp for a long time, since about 2002, I think, when I got some ghost shrimp. And was actually able to get the ghost shrimp to breed to a limited extent. They produce planktonic larvae that float around in the water column, and the, the mortality rate was pretty high, but I got a few to metamorphose and grow up, and that was fun to watch uh, that process. But it wasn't until I moved to Hawaii when I started keeping um, neocaridina shrimp, uh, the, like the red cherry shrimp, the same species that everyone's familiar with as red cherry shrimp, but the wild type, which uh, have been feral in Hawaii for a long time now. And people would uh, pull them out of the uh, pull them out of the creeks in the pet store. Okay, Tanuvial Dancer is in. Hi, welcome. So um, they would pull them out of the creeks and sell them for ten cents um, each. So I, I picked some up about a week after moving to Hawaii, and they began breeding for me. And I kept them for a long time. I kept them until probably about 2014 or something like that. And I also began keeping uh, Opaiula, which are a Hawaiian native species of shrimp that live in brackish water, mostly underground, and they ascend to pools to feed uh, at certain times, but they breed underground. And so those Opaiula shrimp, I started keeping those in around 2004, I believe, and have kept them ever since, and now I have hundreds of them. They've been breeding very successfully since then. Um, I've also kept Amano shrimp, although of course I've never bred them. That's a very specialized activity, very difficult to do. Um, but I have kept them successfully for years. I've also kept uh, peppermint shrimp, which are marine species that eat Aptasia anemones. So um, those are some, uh, some experience I've had with true shrimp. Now I've kept a lot of other types of shrimp as well. So um, I'm going to start answering some shrimp questions. So Johnny Huerta says, do ghost shrimp need brackish water to breed? Not necessarily. It depends on the species. A lot of species are sold as ghost shrimp, and some of them may or may not require brackish water to breed. The species that I bred did not. Basically, um, the, the babies, as I mentioned, they're planktonic. They float around in the water column for a while and uh, are very vulnerable during that time. Uh, one person that I talked to said that at this time they're susceptible to hitting the, the sides of the glass and that, that they hurt themselves that way and can die and that's why. So I put some in some really densely planted tanks and then I would find the little larvae and then I would see them metamorphose after a few weeks and then they would gradually grow up. So like I said, the mortality was really high. I did not get a, a great survivability rate, but that was my first experience raising shrimp and it did work. Um, it's just, you know, not, not very well. Famous Jones says, good timing. I just bought some fire red cherry shrimp for a 15 gallon low brackish tank from a local New York City breeder. Awesome. Yeah, I have heard that, that cherry shrimp can do well at low uh, salinity brackish. So, um, and the fire reds are beautiful. I've had uh, the red types as well. Once I got back here to the mainland, I began keeping um, the red cherry shrimp, although I've never had fire reds, but I even did some, I hybridized, not hybridized, I guess it's an, um, just crossed the um, wild cherries with the um, fire reds. It was kind of fun. And Famous Jones says the tank includes eight guppies. Yeah, and that, that should work fine as long as you have plenty of hiding places for the shrimp. In my uh, tank that I've 
my endler's tank, I'm going to put some shrimp in there. I've got a lot of rocky hideaways for them. I've got two or three large rock structures that are kind of hollow on the inside. They're lace rock. And I've shoved a lot of like cobble sized rocks into them. So there are a lot of little interstices for them to hide in. So um, if you do something like that, it should work pretty well. I learned about that from L.R. Bretz. Um, so Michael Salazar says, could you try raising tadpole shrimp? Actually, I have on numerous occasions. I wasn't including those in my, uh, um, my shrimp that I listed before because they're not true shrimp, but they are true crustaceans. And I've kept tadpole shrimp on numerous occasions. If you have any specific questions, let me know. I'm happy to answer them. Um, I've kept a lot of other types of things with shrimp in the name. I've kept uh, clam shrimp and fairy shrimp of various species and seed shrimp and different things like that as well. So if you have any specific questions about tadpole shrimp, I'm more than happy to answer them. I think even though they're not true shrimp, it should uh, fit. It should fit here. So um, Rico's Reef says, hello, long time. It has been a while. Welcome. Welcome back. And Tanuvial Dancer said, what are you planning to do with the blue shrimp? Well, I'm planning on breeding them. They're pretty uh, easy to breed. They, they are basically the same as red cherry shrimp. They're just blue. So it'll be uh, fun to get them breeding in with the endlers. I, I like the fact that the blue velvet shrimp as well as the um, endlers have some brilliant blue coloration. I think that'll be kind of fun. And I actually have one blue shrimp right now. I was at one of my uh, favorite pet stores that I don't get to go to very often because it's now far away from my house, but I happen to be in that area. Picked up uh, one. They had one left because I was planning on getting more, and I figured, hey, this is just a way to um, make the uh, gene pool a little more varied. Pick one up now and then get some more later. So I only have one. But, uh, yeah, I'm planning on, on breeding them there. I may eventually expand to do two tanks. I'm kind of thinking of putting a 29-gallon. Um, under my multi-tank, because it's a 29-gallon, getting a double stand, putting it there, and doing both shrimp and endlers in both of those. Because the endlers are quickly overtaking the 20, as I expected they would. So, Joshua's carnivore says, Do Armadillidium maculatum make good first pet isopods? I already have a Diplocentris and... Oh, I'm losing the chat, just a second. Pulling it back up. Diplocentris and Centuroides scorpion and three millipedes. If you've done millipedes before... I would say that the isopods, Armadillidium maculatum, the zebra isopods, would be good first pet isopods. They're very similar to millipedes in most respects. If you're using the same substrate as your millipedes, you'll do well as far as substrate goes. And they do require a little bit more ventilation, and they like it a little drier than millipedes, but other than that, their care is virtually identical. So you should be great, especially if you've had your millipedes for a while and you feel like you're doing well with them. I'd be interested in finding out what species you have millipede. I have several millipede species myself and have had others in the past, so that would be fun. Daniel D. says, Hi, just got here. How's your day going? Well, it's been a crazy day. We started late because of some unexpected things that happened, uh, but uh, it's not bad. Now it's, it's better. I'm, I'm here and I'm in the live stream, so that's always fun. I'm glad to be here and uh, having fun. So how's your day going? I hope, hope it's going well. And Johnny Huerta says, Has you, have, have you or plan to keep turtles? In the past, in the distant past, I kept turtles. I wouldn't mind keeping turtles again. I really enjoy turtles. And I, there's some species I'm really interested in. Some of the very small musk turtles sound really fun, especially since, from what I understand, you can keep them without UVB light and uh, in an essentially aquatic setup, which sounds pretty easy and pretty fun. Um, I've also, I've kept red sliders before. I've babysat uh, box turtles, but never actually owned any. And then um, I would be really interested in keeping some type of tortoise. Uh, that would be a lot of fun. Uh, I enjoy all the species, really, but those are some that have caught my interest. And then, of course, there are some uh, others that are unattainable, but I would be interested in doing it. I mean, some of the really large tortoises, like a sulcata or something, there's probably no way I could ever do that unless I moved to a place where I could keep it outdoors, but that would be fun. Uh, but I did keep red-eared sliders in the past. I owned, owned uh, a couple of those. Paul Blackman said, Do I need to feed my shrimp? So, okay, coming back up the chat. Okay. Do I need to feed my shrimp separate to my neon tetras? Well, in my experience, I've kept, I know people, they talk a lot about, you know, what you feed the shrimp and what you feed the fish and how, you know, some foods are supposed to be bad for shrimp, but 
I know some exist. I've heard some successful breeders feed their shrimp nothing but, you know, run of the mill fish flakes, and they seem to be fine. In the past, when I have bred red cherry shrimp and the wild types of that species, I have not had any problem feeding them fish food, and they've bred and survived for many, many generations. So, not necessarily. And I have kept them with me on tetras, uh, specifically without any problems. Um, well, when I say without any problems, without any food problems. I have had, uh, I had a 20 gallon long with Neon Tetras and Corydoras punctatus, I believe it was at the time. And this was, you know, more than 10 years ago. And the, uh, the shrimp bred in that uh, tank without a problem, but we did have some of them get eaten. They, they were eaten by, uh, you know, when they would molt, I, I saw like the Corys slurp them up once or twice, just molting once. But other than that, they seem to do well. And Zerikul cool Ninja 88 says, "Hello, what's up? I could, I caught the sh the show live. Shout out to my lady. She is watching with me. All right. Yep, a shout out to your lady. Happy to do that for you. And thanks for joining. And Sid Gao says, "How do you care for clown isopods? Clown isopods are a little different than most of the other Armadillidium isopods. They're very." Um, very similar to them in appearance, except for their color, but as far as uh, temperature, they like it a little bit warmer. And they seem to like it a little bit drier. They still need a humid area to retreat to, but um, they, they seem to like it a little warmer. So a lot of people keep them, you know, 80, 85 degrees. Uh, and uh, I try to I make one side of my vivarium a little warmer than the other, keep a, a cooler, moister side and then a warmer side. And they seem to be doing well. They're starting to reproduce. So that's working. They do need more ventilation than a lot of other isopods, uh, but not more than other armadillidium species. They're just about the same. So good ventilation for them. Other than that, they do really well. I have heard they like uh, protein-rich foods more than some of the others, and I do give mine fish food pellets, but I give all my isopods fish food pellets as part of their diet. So I, I don't really consider that being different, but hopefully that helps a little bit. And thanks to all of you who have hit the like button. If anybody else hasn't done so and would like to do so, I would love that. That would be really helpful. Helps keep the show uh, going by making more people see it. So, Andrew Chen says, Hey, Russ, do you keep ferns? Oh, thank you. I see people hitting the like button. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Hey, Russ, do you keep ferns? It keeps popping off. Sorry. Let me bring it back up. Okay. I am planning to keep these beautiful plants for my praying mantis. However, I am struggling to keep them alive. Some help, please. I do keep ferns, and I have kept other ferns. What kind of ferns are you keeping? Right now, I have lemon button ferns. It's the only species I'm keeping at the moment. Uh, let's see. That may or may not be true. But the only terrestrial fern I'm keeping at the moment. And they do really well at very high humidity. What kind of mantis are you keeping? Because that might be part of the deal. Um, ferns and mantids, there are some that have you know, approximately equal humidity requirements and others that don't. Uh, and also, tell me a little bit about your lighting situation and what kind of substrate you're using with the fern, and that, that could be really helpful. Rosie McLeod says, can neon tetras go with bettas? Well, I will say yes with some reservations. Uh, I personally think that it can be done, but it's not ideal for a couple of reasons but it can sometimes be successful, if that makes sense. One, I would say that neons prefer temperatures slightly cooler than bettas do. Not that you can't both find a temperature with the, at which they will survive. Like you can keep the uh, aquarium at say 76 degrees. It might be slightly on the warmer end of comfortable for the neons and slightly on the cooler end of comfortable for the bettas, but it could work. Um, some bettas are just gonna be more aggressive than others. Some will completely leave the neons alone and some will try to attack them. You know, bettas have a lot of, they have different personalities, so um, with some bettas it will work and some won't. For example, I have seen um, bettas that will attack snails ferociously and kill every snail they see, and I have some that completely, have had some that completely ignore snails, just to give you an idea of how that works. Um, so, can be done um, if, if you really want to try it, you know, you, and you go into it with the knowledge that it may or may not work, uh, and you're aware of the issues of temperature, um, it can be done. Uh, one thing to, to keep in mind, you may want to consider having the neons well established in the tank before you put the beta in there. If you add them after the beta has already established kind of 
his home in the aquarium, you might find that the better views them as food. But if he is introduced to the tank and the neons are already comfortable, they know their hiding places and they know how to get around the tank, it might help a little bit. But it's not necessarily ideal. Okay, so Daniel D said, did you know that shrimp eat baby snails? Well, shrimp can eat a lot of things, so I wouldn't be too surprised if they would pick on some baby snails. I've never had a situation where I've had shrimp eating enough baby snails to really cause a problem with the population, but I wouldn't be too surprised if that happened, especially since right after they hatch, their shells aren't really that uh, protective. So it makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. Let's see. Um, just trying to find out where I am, everybody. Sorry. Michael Salazar says, I have an outdoor pond that gets pretty cold in the winter, but plenty warm in the summer. My question is if I could keep Daphne a tadpole shrimp or fairy shrimp in it. You probably could. Well, let's talk about this. Um, it's possible that you could um, keep them in it, but it partly depends on the water, um, water parameters because most of those species are uh, adapted to live in you know, vernal pools, so temporary pools, and they could probably survive the winter as eggs and overwinter that way and then hatch in the spring. But it kind of depends on your water parameters because many of them, this is less true for Daphnia, but more true for tadpole shrimp and mini fairy shrimp, is that they need water with very few dissolved solids in it, like rainwater, distilled water, RO water, uh, for a good hatch rate. You might get a few to hatch otherwise, but um, that kind of water stimulates their eggs to hatch. And then as they grow, they can become, they're more tolerant of water with more minerals in it because in, in the wild it rains. So they get this water with very few dissolved minerals in it. But as the rain sits there and begins to evaporate and begins to draw minerals from the surrounding substrate, uh, it gets, uh, you know, there's more minerals in it. So um, your water parameters could have something to do with their hatch rates. And also if you have any fish in the pond, you probably won't have very many of any of those because they'll get eaten. But, um, Assuming there are no fish in the pond, you could probably overwinter them in there. And as long as the water starts out with low dissolved solids in the spring, if you get a lot of rainfall into it, it could very well work. It's very possible. Okay. Let's see. All right. Joshua's carnivore says the millipedes I have are Orthopterus ornatus, or Orthoporus ornatus. Sorry. Do you keep carnivorous plants? If you do, which species? Well. The millipedes, okay, Orthoporus ornatus, those are some of the uh, southwestern desert millipedes. And that is a species I have not kept, but I have read a little bit about it, know a little bit about it. Um, but those will have very similar requirements to the uh, zebra pill bugs you were asking about. So you can keep them basically identically. So that's good. And then he also asks, do you have any carnivorous plants? Um, well, I have kept carnivorous plants. I have kept Venus flytraps, and let's see, I've kept um, the Cape sundews, and I really enjoyed them both, and I would like to do some more. I need a better place outside where I can keep the, um, the Venus flytraps during the year, um, for a, a, and then have a good dormancy period. I've, I've had successful dormancy periods in the refrigerator with a, a Venus flytrap, but um, then when I put it out for the summer, Again, the year after, it kind of slowly declined, and I'm not sure if it was just a bad specimen or what, but I've, I've kept other ones more successfully for longer periods of time. And the Cape Sundews were really fun, but they eventually succumbed to aphids, which was really sad. I, I tried to treat them for that, but it was unsuccessful. But I'd like to try again sometime. And Zerical Ninja 88 says, I do enjoy the live streams. Thanks for staying active. Well, thank you. I really am glad that you appreciate it, and I appreciate your presence here, too. Fishhead2925 says, Hello, Russ and friends. I received two yellowtail spiny eels for Christmas unexpectedly, and there's a lot of conflicting info online. Okay. Do you know anything about freshwater eels? Those particular species, not really. Uh, the yellow spiny tail eels. Um, I wish I could tell you I did, but I don't. Um, if anyone else knows and has kept that species, that would be... Um, useful if you know some good um, sources of info for that, because I do not. And Rosie McLeod says, I have a female bed in a three-gallon. Could I add neon tetras? Honestly, I wouldn't in a three-gallon. I think uh, a three-gallon is a little on the small side for one 
uh, female betta, and while it can be done, um, I would not add another fish, honestly, to it. I think that's that's just a little too small. Um, let's see. And moldy something I can't pronounce, but uh, moldy. So can you show us your leopard gecko, please? Well, let's see if I can get uh, my daughter. If she's in the, if she can hear my voice, if she could bring me the gecko. That would be cool. Otherwise. I couldn't move all this equipment, but if she can do it, that would be fun. Um, Andrew Chen says, false garden mantis. Okay, so um, I'm guessing, I could be wrong, but um, that this species of mantis probably needs a little bit lower humidity than most ferns, but the silver lady fern, okay. Um, do you have a scientific name on that? Uh, that might help me, I don't know. Sometimes uh, the, the common name is going to be too different, and I wouldn't be able to tell you. So, Sid... Gao says, do you know why clown isopod is so expensive? I think it has to do with a lot of things. I think one thing is as soon as a new isopod comes in on the scene, especially if it has amazing colors like the clown isopod does, that um, it sells for whatever you know people will pay for it, and people will pay a lot. And it will eventually settle down once uh, they begin to breed a lot. Um, that has happened with other species of isopod. When zebra isopods first came on the scene, they were about as expensive as clown isopods are now. But they become, uh, you know, they'll become less expensive because they're really not that hard to breed, and that is um, usually a good sign that their price will come down. Now, isopods' prices don't come down as quickly as some other things because they just don't breed as quickly as some other things. So, um, you know, it won't be as fast, and they won't go down as much. They tend to be a little bit more stable in price, I've noticed than some other organisms because of that, but they will come down. Neon Tetra Aquarist, hi! Oh, um, by the way, Neon Tetra Aquarist just reached 1,000 subscribers, so shout out to Neon Tetra Aquarist for doing that. If you haven't checked out his channel, he's got some great stuff. He's got some really fun tanks and, and so on, so check him out. Um, and then Who Said Aqua says, hello. Um, hello and greetings. And, Tanubial Dancer says, for those just coming in, we're having a shrimpish discussion. Thank you. Yes, we are talking a lot about shrimp today. Oh, and Rosie McLeod says, do you have a cat? Yes, we do. We have a cat. His name is Cosmo, and he is... Let's see. Do you want to help me out? My daughter, Laurelyn, is going to help me out with that. Um, okay. Um, you can do one and then the other if you want to. Yeah, okay, she's going to bring the bird over. And Neon Tetra Aquarius says, thank you. You're welcome. I think we need to, you know, you, you have a great channel going and people need to know about it. So let's see. Um, my screen is frozen, so I hope you can see Twilly on my shoulder now. Um, I don't know if you can because I'm not getting good feedback from the screen. But Varenid Guy says, are you still interested in the plants? Rosette Swords and Window Love Java Fern. I could send some stem plants too if you're interested. I totally would be. Let's do it. Um, what is the easiest way for you to... Um, to get into contact specifically. Um, the easiest way for me is uh, just if you can email me and you can do that from my About tab or from the contact page. In the, um, the contact page in the, what am I saying? The, my website, aquarimax.com. If you can contact me either of those ways, um, then that would totally work because I would be so happy to do it. I would love it. Okay. Neon Tetra Aquarius said, I'm pretty sure the video froze, but not the audio. This may be on my part, though. Well, my, my video is frozen, and Andrew Chen says, why are you frozen? Darn. How many, of, <coughs> is, how many of you can still hear the audio? Let me know if you can hear the audio and if I'm frozen, because if, I, I appear to be frozen from here, but you seem to be catching my audio, so just want to find out how that's working. So, yeah, Veranda Guy, thank you very much. Let's work this out. This would be really cool. Wait, you already have my email anyway, don't you? We've emailed because you won that... Uh, you won the contest, and so I sent you stuff. So you already have my email. You don't even need to find it. And uh, so, yeah, you're, you're good to go then. That, uh, good thing we remembered that. Okay. So Rosie McLeod says, I can hear you, but you're frozen. Famous Jones screen is frozen, but audio is clear. Sid Gao says, I can hear you, but I can't see you. Okay. So it's, it's coming in. Um, the video is probably just frozen because of bandwidth problems or something. Uh, so, okay. Well, we'll keep the audio going and hopefully the video will catch up. Thank you everybody for um, letting me know what's going on. And I'm not sure why it's frozen. I'm not sure what I can do about it, honestly, but at least uh, everybody can um, 
hear me, so that's great. All right. Um, what was that? Should I put Puggo away since the video's frozen? Oh, um, let's see. Let's see what happens here, what people say. Okay, Daniel D says he went off of YouTube and back on, and nothing happened. Oh, okay. And so we'll just hope that it comes back soon. And if not, in five minutes, we'll, we'll kill it. And hopefully it will work better next week. But uh, at least we will have gotten some. And if you watch the video later, um, yeah, Lorelin, let's, let's, uh, let's do that. And we'll, we'll try to show Pugo next time, the leopard gecko, because the video's dead and it doesn't do much good. Thank you for bringing her, though. All right. Ida Ticker 814 says, I stumbled on this channel looking at videos of fairy shrimp. And then I saw that there's a live discussion. Cool. Well, if you have any questions about fairy shrimp that I can answer, happy to help. I have kept several types of fairy shrimp before. Welcome, C.L. Roman. And, um, okay. Andrew Chen has given me the scientific name of the firm, Blechnum Bibum. All right. Jacob Day, hey. All right. So, um, Andrew, that is not a fern I'm familiar with. So, um, what I would say, though, is um, if you can tell me a little bit more about your setup. Like, what does your setup look like? How much humidity does it retain? What kind of humidity does your, does your mantis need? Maybe we can figure a few things out. Rosie McLeod says, do better fish need a heater? Well, they certainly do better at warmer temperatures. I would say if you can provide temperatures between 76 and approximately 80 to 82, then you're good to go. If you can keep those temperatures stable without a heater, then you're good to go. If you can't keep them stable without a heater, I would highly recommend one. They do a lot better that way. I know some people keep bettas at uh, cooler temperatures, but I've just never found them to be particularly happy and active unless they're at uh, you know, somewhat elevated temperatures. So it may mean in the summer you won't need a heater, uh, but you might need uh, one in the winter. Uh, there are a lot of heaters for fairly small tanks. If yours is in a three-gallon tank, there are a couple of heaters out there that'll do the job uh, that I've had good experiences with in smaller tanks. So, yeah, they, they would do better. And Peter Thiele says, you can speak without moving your lips. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm usually not quite as good at that, but tonight, I don't know, I just seem to have the gift. I, and I, I can stand stock still and answer all kinds of questions. I should get a drink and you can watch me drink and not even move my lips or, or move a cup. You won't even, you'll hear me drink and not see it. So, yeah, I really don't know what's going on. Potato Derp in the house. Nice to have you back. All right. So, any, anybody else have any more shrimpy questions or any other just general aquarium and vivarium questions or comments you'd like to bring up? Oh, we've got 19 likes. That is great. If anybody else would like to join in and smash that button, that would be great. Jacob Day says, how long does it take to get starter culture of springtails off the ground and producing in high volume? Oh, thank you. Hitting the like button. Um, that takes, um, it depends on the species of springtail partly, and it dep depends on uh, how much you feed. I'll give you a couple of tips here. What species do you have? That, that might help, but um, let me tell you that Fulsomia candida is one of the fastest species. They're incredibly fast. Um, you can get them producing in high volume in probably, well, depending on how you feed, maybe three weeks to a month. And I would say um, Sinella curbaceta, which is another species that I work with, takes longer, maybe six weeks to two months. Um, it also depends on the food. If you have a really good food and you're feeding basically as soon as the food is gone, so approximately every 24 hours, you try to get to the point where you're feeding them every uh, 24 hours, uh, and there's a tiny bit of food left so that they're never without food, that will, um, that will help. Okay? Uh, that will make a, a big difference um, in keeping them producing fast. And also, the quality of food that you have. I have noticed that you can try using just one food, it, you don't get as good results as you do when you get like a mixed food. I, I started using uh, nutritional yeast for mine, and I did that for a while. Oh, Andrew Chen has got to go. Thank you for joining us, Andrew. Um, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't yield such good results. When I mix nutritional yeast and spirulina and pea powder, which is like my favorite springtail food now, 
I use that and I would say, you know, this isn't a scientific estimate, this is a, just a, from my head, but it seems like the production and speed with which they reproduce is tripled, honestly. So um, that will really help. Keeping enough food in there so that they always have a little bit of food. By the time you feed them again, there's a little bit left in the, uh, in the shrimp culture, or the, the springtail culture, and that you use a good uh, food mix will make a big difference. So Rosie McLeod says, how much should you feed bettas? Well, bettas uh, usually get overfed, truly. Um, I would say it, it partly depends on what you're feeding to. Are you feeding live foods? Are you feeding pellets and so on? But I find that, uh, and it's also males and females, you have different issues going on because females are prone to being egg bound and things like that. But if you feed, uh, it also depends on the size of the pellets that you get. Uh, if you get really small pellets, you can feed more, obviously. So I would say if you get one of the really small beta pellets, you could do uh, like five to seven pellets a day, depending. Separate that at different times of the day. And then if you skip a day or two a week, that's often good. But uh, if you're feeding, for example, live Daphnia, you can feed a few more because they're big, but they're, there's a lot of uh, water space in there. A lot of the bulk of the Daphnia is water, so you can feed more of them. So... Hopefully that helps a little bit. Ted Tyron says, Hi, when my shrimp molts, do I need to remove the old shell and white antennae? Not necessarily. A lot of times something in the tank will end up eating those and do it pretty fast. Um, and it's usually not a problem. So I would say that's, that's fine to leave it in there. Potato Drip says, I bought a praying mantis egg case recently. I wonder how long it will take them for them to hatch. Well, usually, uh, depending on the species, but they have to be... Uh, exposed to fairly warm temperatures for a couple of weeks um, if, if they're going to be uh, before they'll hatch. If you're keeping them indoors or outdoors, that's going to make a difference, obviously. But um, I have had a um, mantis egg cage hatch indoors in the middle of winter. Not a great thing. So um, it's good to, to keep them outside if you can, just to keep uh, them from hatching too soon. Daniel D says, well, I got to go. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. And thank you for joining us so much and hope to see you again in the live stream. And CL Roman says, do you know um, if ammonia burn can cause a fish to be blind? I wouldn't be surprised because it can do a lot of damage and if it, it could damage their eyes conceivably, so that, that makes sense. It would be pretty severe ammonia burn, but it could happen. It makes sense. Famous Jones says, can different types of shrimp coexist? I have no interest in breeding at this time. Yes, actually. Um, I know that Alar Bretz, for example, sells... Um, what he calls, I think it's the Skrittles mix, and that is several different types of shrimp. Um, but do you mean breeds or species? Because some, sometimes that can happen too. There are species that can coexist. Um, I've kept, I think I, I want to say I've kept a mono shrimp and cherry shrimp together without a problem. Um, it can happen. But also the different, uh, different varieties of shrimp that are the same species can coexist, but if they will hybridize, then they can, you can end up with some pretty interesting results or some really crummy, dull results, depending. Um, but if, if you have no interest in breeding, your shrimp may have other ideas, but I guess what you mean is you're not trying to breed for specific varieties, so you don't really care what happens um, if the babies you know, come out funny, I guess. Uh, maybe that's what you mean. And if so, it's not a, not a particular problem. Or if you're more thinking that you could get one uh, shrimp of different species, one or two right, one or two of each different type, and then not expect them to breed it. Maybe that's what you're saying. So Rosie McLeod says, when will your next live stream be? Well, I'm shooting for Tuesdays at uh, 5.30 U.S. Mountain Time. Today I had to start a little late because of unforeseen circumstances, but I'll try to be as consistent as possible. 5.30 U.S. Mountain Time. Uh, on Tuesdays. That seems to be the best time because I'm usually at home either alone or with very few other people in the house and it's when I have a, a chunk of time to get it done. And it seems to be a pretty decent time for people to participate too. It's not too late for those of you who are, you know, uh, further east in the U.S. for me and it's early enough for uh, people in lots of other parts of the world to participate. So um, that's kind of what I'm shooting for and hopefully that's working for people. It seems to be. Well, uh, I want to 
I'm a little bit uh, over time, but I do want to keep it open for just a minute longer if anybody else has any comments or questions uh, that you'd like to share. Thank you for all those likes. 23 likes. That is awesome. Uh, that's pretty good for, uh, for the live stream. Uh, and especially considering you can't see me and I'm frozen. That, oh, and here's some more likes too, so nice. Um, yeah. Not bad at all for a frozen live stream. And you know, you can always catch it after it uh, processes and it might be a little better. All right, well, I'm not getting any other uh, questions popping up, so thank you all for, for joining. I hope to be able to have some good news about some blue shrimp that I'm getting soon. Uh, oh, here's a, here's a couple of questions, and we'll finish these up here. Famous Jones says, I'm thinking of getting yellow, yellow and blue shrimp to go with the red cherry shrimp if they survive with the guppies. Oh, okay. Yeah. So as long as you have a lot of hiding places, they should do fine. I've kept them with guppies with success. I know a lot of other people do. So you could keep them and just not worry about what the babies look like. So... Yeah, they, they would certainly survive together well. You probably would get some hybridization, but if you don't care, then it's not that big of a deal. And Potato Derp says, The eggs are in warm, humid air. It is in the middle of winter where I live, so I will raise them indoors. I will release some outside when it is warm enough, and we'll keep some indoors. I see. Okay. So what have you got lined up for the food for them? Uh, for the little baby mentids. Um, Famous Jones says, Thanks for the info. No problem. Hopefully it is helpful. And i um, like to hear about uh, how things follow up. Okay, Rosie McLeod says, There's a little white thing on my bed of stomach, and I don't know what it is. It's like a little stick thing. That is probably the ovipositor, because you mentioned it's a female bed, am I right? So um, an ovipositor is merely just, it's an egg tube, and it's often visible on the females. It's not a problem. Uh, you don't have to worry about it, but it's a, it's a natural uh, structure there. Uh, you do have to worry about female bettas getting egg bound. That can happen. Um, they just get full of eggs and they, they are not expressing the eggs because they don't have a male to mate with. So that could be an issue, but that ovipositor by itself is not an issue at all. So potato derp says fungus gnats. Ah, that's, uh, if, if you can get enough fungus gnats, that, that might work all right. Oh, and buffalo worms. Okay, if you have uh, a supply of buffalo worms, that should help as well. Cool. Um, fruit flies are really great for them as well, um, but as long as you're getting them some flying insects, that, that's good, that's helpful. You're going to have to have a lot of fungus nets, though, to be able to raise a lot of them, so I don't know how many you're planning on keeping. They're, they're going to eat a lot. Um, Jacob Day, have a good one. You too. Thanks for joining in. So I would recommend, uh, if you can, getting some flightless fruit fly cultures going for them, at least one, and that will be really helpful to you. Um, partly because fungus gnats, there's not much to them. There's not a lot of meat in there, if you will. Um, fruit flies are a little more substantial, so that'll help. But uh, in any case, I do wish you well with those. That'll be fun. I haven't raised, uh, I haven't had a mantis for a while, for several years. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting some. I think this spring I'm probably going to order, order a mantis or two and, and try that out again, because it's been a while and I really enjoy them. Okay, everyone, we're coming up on 40 uh, minutes. We're almost there. So thanks for joining us. Um, I'm going to have a video out on Friday, uh, 4.30 Mountain Time, U.S. Mountain Time, as always. And you're always welcome to send in ideas for future videos. If there are things you're interested in seeing, I, I really appreciate that. So feel free to do that. And C.L. Roman says, have a good night. Thanks. And I say the same to all of you. Enjoy your day, night, whatever time it happens to be where you are. And we'll see you next time.